There we go. Thank you, guys. Uh, first, I just want to have a short round of applause for our panelists here. Thank you so much for being here today, especially on this day. All righty, so I'm going to start it off with some bio. So again, bear with me. So first, to my left here, we have Vonda Chapel, and she is the managing director at Kaufman and Canoles, the Chesapeake office here, and they focus, their practice rather, focuses on trust and estate planning, commercial transactions, including structuring corporations, limited liability companies, and partnerships. She was actually the previous chair of Chesapeake Economic Development Authority. Thank you. Good morning. All righty, and next we have Dr. Wanda Bernard Bailey. She is the Deputy City Manager of Chesapeake, and she has been since August of 2005. And as such, she was the city's first Chief Equity Officer in June of 2020. And she's responsible for, and this is a list, so <laughs> here we out, Department of Human Services, Human Resources, Libraries, Call Center, and Integrated Behavioral Healthcare. And next we have Dr. Kimberly Frost. She's the president and CEO of RFK Solutions, a cybersecurity solutions company. And founded in 2012, RFK strives to develop innovative and technological solutions to meet their clients' business needs. And actually before founding the company, Kimberly retired from the Navy in October of 2007 after 20 years of honorable service as information chief petty officer. And last but certainly not the least, we have Kristen Parkinson, the COO of Joe Kell. She was actually promoted to that position in November of 2020. She was initially hired on as the lead of the Jacksonville branch. And during that time, she led the team to over 500%, and I'm gonna repeat that number, 500% revenue growth during her tenure. And currently, she oversees their day-to-day -day operations. All right, now just to loosen everybody up. <laughs> so what I always do in interviews, just loosen everyone up. We're gonna start off with some lightning round questions. So I just wanna hear about what was the first job each of you had? My first paying job, let's call it that way, um, was in high school. I was in the VICA program. I went to Kempsville High School in Virginia Beach and I was in the VICA program and took a job as a receptionist um, and went to school in the morning, left at noon. That was a draw of that program, to get out at noon. And um, headed to U.S. Flag and Signal Company in Virginia Beach, and I was their part-time afternoon receptionist. Wow. Oh, and what are you, Doctor? Good morning. My first was in a record store. I'm sure that some people are going, what is a record? <laughs> <laughs> and so that was uh, my first job in which, uh, at 16, that was like the ultimate job that you could ever have because you had to listen to music, you had to know what it was about, you had to know, the, um, you know who the creators were, so that when the persons came in, not only did you have to know where to go find it, but you also had to know the genre of music that they liked and you could introduce them to new genres of music. So it was very exciting at 16 to be able to do that. I had lots of friends because they thought I was getting free music, which I did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, my first job, it was so exciting. I worked for the uh, county's public library system. I was a librarian. I started there at the age of 13. They had summer programs that they would pick us up with, but I actually stayed a librarian and graduated all the way up into uh, one of the lead librarians that I just grad when I graduated high school. So from the age of 13 to 18, I was a librarian, and then I joined the United States Navy. Well, my first job is not quite as glamorous. I worked the fries at McDonald's. So um, I, I can tell you how much salt to put on a vat of fries when you drop them and how long they take. So my first job was at McDonald's. It did not last very long, but it was my first job. You know, I am a very dedicated app member, so I'm gonna have to talk to you after this. Okay, fair. <laughs> so we talked about, you know, first jobs. I wanna know, especially as you know, professionals, and you're on this panel for a reason. What did those first jobs teach you that you really held with you? 
I think mine was time management and responsibility and dedication to a task. Um, I was in high school, so I was being exposed to some of those things um, from someplace other than a home setting for the first time. But I think that sense of accountability. I'd have to say that um, it is the joy of being able to give and to help people is that it's the little things. You don't recognize um, how much people appreciate good customer service. So I think that was one of the skills that I learned is that customer service is the ultimate uh, gift that you can give someone. I would say responsibility and being loyal to something that, I mean, working in a library at the age of 13, 14, 15, you know, who would want to do that? But <laughs> my mother taught us to, you know, to stand strong in what you are doing. So I believe that responsibility, loyalty, you know, that's what I learned. Um, the first would be that if you put pickles on a grease burn, it does take the sting <laughs> out of it. I did learn that. Um, <laughs> But um, a little more serious, um, what, I, I would agree with responsibility, and I definitely learned that, well, that, that first job was something that taught me that responsibility. I knew it wasn't what I wanted to do the rest yeah. of my life. Mm -hmm. So having the drive to go right. find what that next step was. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm just like, every time they say something, I'm just like holding on so, <laughs> so intently. Um, so as we're here, International Women's Day, I really want to talk about some challenges women can face in professional industries, in their careers, in business. I mean, did each of you, were there any challenges you realized that you were facing because you were a woman as you came up through your professional careers? I think mine um, was not so much a woman, but a mother, um, and trying to be a good employee and be there when I needed to be there, but still being a good mom for my son and juggling those responsibilities and trying to, and you can, I've, I've learned you can do it all. They mm -hmm. say you can't, but you can. Um, I think you've just got to have really good time management, but to try to be all things to all people sometimes is difficult, but I think your priorities really set your path in motion. Um, and I was just determined that I was going to try to be the best I could at both of those tasks. Mm. That's amazing. <laughs> what about you, Dr. Bailey? I think that was well said, Vonda. Um, I, too, um, it's ironic, but motherhood was the first thing that came to my mind because it was not initially um, thought that it would be in my plans to, to have that responsibility. And what a big responsibility is, but you can indeed um, balance those things. But I think it's a matter of what it is that you want to do and the role models that you have in your life. My mother was a working mother. And um, so to put it in context, um, my mother was born in 1926. Um, so she was 90 when she passed. And the value that she put in being able, my parents, and, and uh, my father was there as well, he passed when um, they had been married 30 plus years. And so, but my mother had um, her last daughter, her fourth daughter, um, when she was 45. And so she was a single mother at um, you know, the age of um, 55 plus. Mm -hmm. So who experiences that? I mean, when you think about it, she was really a trailblazer yeah. in terms of being a single mother um, and you know, being 45 and having a child is something that at that particular time was not something that occurred now. You know, people are having them when they're in their, their 40s and 50s. But I think that having her as a role model to show that balance of that you can um, be a working mother, that you can indeed um, not have it all, but also she taught me that you need to be able to share the load. My father was very engaged with us and we couldn't tell who had what responsibility. It wasn't unusual for my father to wash clothes or to cook dinner and my mother to go out and cut the grass or whatever needed to be done. So I think it's that balance. And so I also was fortunate enough and blessed enough to have a husband that supported that responsibility. And I see that, you know, family means a lot. I see that um, she also has her husband here. And I think that that's just it, your family or whoever your support system is, those are the persons that help to guide you and protect you and to help make you successful in terms of what it is that you want to do. So 
Um, but it is a, a, an effort of, of love and balance that helps you through this. Wow, I would say when it comes to challenges, mine was, I was in the military, veteran, um, and we were dual military. So it wasn't like I was mm -hmm. in the military, he was home with the children. So balance, like you said, was very, very um, challenging for us mm -hmm. to have children in the military and to have to leave your children. You know, we couldn't take them in a sea bag. That was all, what we was always told. <laughs> you can't pack your kids up and take them with you in a sea bag. So having a, a village was really important to Ricardo and I. Um, mm -hmm. When it came to our development, it, yeah, that, cha that was a big challenge. And the fact that not only being in the military, but having to work with men, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I was on an aircraft carrier and there were 5,000 men and we had a battle group so that made it about 8,000 men it would be 500 women. So just imagine having to be a leader. I've always been a leader and I thank my mom for that, for teaching us how to be strong and stand up for ourselves no matter mm -hmm. what environment you are in. And I was one of one woman mostly of 1,000, 2,000 men leading men. So that in itself is a challenge, was a challenge for me, but I believe that with the good Lord, I rose to the occasion and with training um, from my parents and my mother and father. And I'm also grateful and I thank you for making sure you recognize that wonderful husband of mine because having a great spouse standing there with you and helping you also assist with the challenges because we both actually were uh, ITs in the military and we worked together. There were times we were stationed at the same command um, in the same department doing things together and that helped me as well in challenges because I had that bodyguard with me. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't mess with me too hard. But yes, the challenges of being in the military, dual military, working with men, uh, having to have that community to help us with our children because there were times, Raven is my daughter, that I had mm -hmm. to leave her as a mother um, at the age of five years of age when I had never left her before and she had never not been with me. You know, to leave her with someone else, you know, was very challenging for me. So those are some of the challenges I faced, but we overcame. <laughs> um, I could not agree more and you all have said it so nicely it's being a mom is really the most difficult um, challenge I think that we all face but like you said we can do it successfully yeah. and people can your support system um, I have always looked at my career as just being successful at what I do not necessarily gender related uh, I was raised by my father fell out of a tree when I was seven years old mm -hmm. and was paralyzed from the waist down so he overcame significant challenges mm -hmm. um went back to work four months after his accident was told he would never work again and worked until he retired um and shortly right before he passed away so um being raised by somebody who told me you take what life hands you and you just make the best of it mm -hmm. um that really gave me the foundation to overcome any challenges that stood in my way in my career um i too have a wonderful husband who's here um, who has always been by my side yes. and supported me and as I've traveled throughout my career, you know, he's been, he was home with our son when he was younger and vice versa. We just made it work. Right. Um, and having that support system and a great spouse and a great team of people is key. And you build that by being committed to them and when they need you and that helps overcome that anytime you need it. And branching off of, actually, yes, you had the right idea. Yeah. You had the right idea. <laughs> take my cues from you from now on. <laughs> but branching off what these incredible women have said, a support system, it takes a village to raise a child. And I think it also takes a village to hone each person's personal career. Is there a mentor that each of you had that you remember or a support system in one particular job or career that helped you along this path to get where you are now? I think I was blessed um, early. My first job in the legal world was for a sole practitioner attorney. It was a male, um, close to home in Virginia Beach, but his wife was his other legal secretary, and that was my first job in the legal field, was with her. Um, and she encouraged me daily um, to reach out, to go into unfamiliar territory to try new things. Um, she was a mother too at the time when I was mm. just in college. Um, so she gave me good advice and I will tell you the piece of advice that I remember her giving me over and over again that I still carry with me is she always told me that God's clock keeps perfect time. Mm. 
And so when things happen that we don't understand, timing and which, why, and all that, I try to always go back to God's clock keeps perfect time. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's good. Something to definitely go by. <laughs> so um, multiple role models. I think that um, it starts out for me, it started out with my family. You've heard me speak of my mother, but I also had other women in my family that um, also served as role models, but probably professionally. Um, Dr. Martha Sawyer, who um, was a social worker um, with Norfolk State, and she retired a few years ago. But she has, um, being a mentor is an ongoing um, in the uh, industry uh, uh, understanding that you have. And so she helped to um, follow me. So um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker by trade, and so and um, we were in a rural area in North Carolina, and to get a license was something that you, you know, wasn't really heard of. Most persons who went into the field of social work usually went into the field uh, relative to social services and not to become therapists. But she was one of the few, um, and she had a daughter who had a disability, and she had two other children, two other uh, daughters. But she asked me to come to her home and to watch her interact and still be able to work with me so that I could get my um, licensure hours was incredible. She was cooking dinner, she was um, helping them with their homework, and then she'd come back and work with me, and I was like, what a multitasker. Yeah. If I can only have that skill set to be able to do all those things and still be a professional um, in my field. And um, she ended up talking about following you through your career. She, this was at the beginning of my career, so I was 22, 21, 22. And then when I went for my um, dissertation, she was the person who ended up being the chair mm. of my dissertation. So that role model or that mentor is someone, like I said, who follows you throughout your career. So if you can find that person in which you really want, know what they want to do and how you want to do it, that's the person. Um, and like I said, I also had multiple family members and male role models as well as females. Awesome stuff. So mentors for me is imperative. I believe that each and every one of us should have a mentor and an accountability partner in our life. I have several uh, mentors, so I never say the one word mentor. I have a mentor for my uh, marriage. Uh, Deaconess Rudette. I would never do anything outside of my marriage because I have her speaking into my life often. I have one in business, Dr. Angela Reddix. She makes sure that I try to stay on track when it comes to things of that nature. When it comes to ministry, we have Dr. Elder, uh, Dr. Elder Valerie Brown. Uh, she assists me. So I try to surround myself with women who have gone where I'm trying to go. You know, I make sure that I stay humble in that, you knowing that there are many other people that they could mentor and have um, with them. So I try to make sure that what I hear from them, I apply. But ensuring that you have people around you is what keeps you humble, what keeps you moving forward, because that's what you need in a mentor. If your mentor is not challenging you, you don't need a mentor that's going to tell you what you want to hear. You need a mentor that's going to challenge everything about you. And that's who you want to surround yourself with, and that's what I try to do. If I feel like I've maybe gotten to a place where my mentor is not doing that for me anymore, then you find yourself another mentor. <laughs> There's nothing that says you have to maintain the same mentor as you traverse this world and this, this life. So my first would um, go back to my father and, you know, my dad, just the foundation of what he raised three kids after an accident with um, me and my sisters. He taught me, I was the youngest, so um, he mentored me into, I can hang a ceiling fan or a light fixture like nobody. He was an electrician, um, but when he lost the ability to climb a ladder, um, I learned real quick how to climb a ladder and do his wiring for him. So my dad was my first. Um, when you talk about having a mentor, that doesn't tell you what you want to hear. Um, my husband falls into that category for me. Um, well, I love him. Um, he also is the one who will challenge me the most and um, often tell me, well, maybe you feel that way, but maybe you need to look in the mirror for a minute and think about why you're reacting the way you are, especially with employee situations. Yes. He's a good um, grounding base for me. And then um, 14 years ago, when I came to Joe Kell, I found home. And um, Susie Kelly is, many of you know her. Um, Susie is just a fantastic mentor. Uh, we talk every day, um, pretty much multiple times a day. And she just gives me such a great foundation for 
bringing JoCal forward, working with our team, understanding the importance of the of community, being here in Chesapeake, giving back to that community, participating with people, um, and just being a mentor to a lot of other people, and having our doors open, our facility open, and really just the kindness open. And Susie really leads me with that. So um, she's just a key part of my day to day. Awesome stuff. And I'm gonna branch off of what you said about each of you keeping your own doors open. So you guys are making this a little bit too easy for me. <laughs> I need to make it a little bit harder. No, um, looking out into this crowd, I see we have a lot of young people here, as I, yes. I say, as I'm 23. Um, but we have a lot of young people here. <laughs> um, and I just know, me personally, hearing each of your stories and reading through your bios myself, I would love to have each and every one of you as my personal mentor. Yeah. But as a mentee, what are you looking for in any young person that you would love to sort of hone and help with their careers? What are you looking for in that? I think you have to have a lot of uh, commonality, but a lot of diversity too mm -hmm. with your, your mentee. I think that's how you learn is, is that diversity factor. Um, certainly someone who's a good communicator um, that's not afraid to talk about what they see, what they fear, what they think. Um, a strong sense of loyalty. I think a strong work ethic is important. Um, and then a commitment to whatever the task at hand is that they decide that's what they're interested in. You said it so well, Londa. Well, you know, next time I want to sit. I feel sorry for the person in that You bring it up. Um, so, um, I think also um, the energy, the excitement, the enthusiasm, and um, don't feel as though you have to come with all the answers. I, as a, as a mentor, I do not have all the answers. But I do think it's a matter of exchange, of learning. Um, I think that you have to make sure that your mentor is excited about what they're doing and what they have to give to you. I think that if, if you're not excited and if I'm not willing to learn from you, then I'm not a good mentor. So um, taking from what, what Fonda said in terms of being able to communicate and communicate on multiple levels, um, to be diverse in terms of it's not just the work part of it, but also your personal life. How does that impact you and how does that impact um, your mentor and you as a mentee in terms of the relationship that you build? I do believe though that um, it is a, a lifetime commitment that you put toward your mentor. So if I'm a mentor, do not expect for me to drop you after a year or two years. I'm still following you and tracking. I'm not stalking you, but I'm going to, to find out what you're doing and so that we can continue our relationship to work to see what it is. And the expectation is, is that um, you will give back, that you too will become a role model and a mentor, a mentee for someone else. So when it comes to me and I, when I'm looking for a mentee, I definitely want someone that has some drive and enthusiasm about what they want to do. Mm -hmm. But I also like to look for that person that's being challenged in life, that they don't have it um, at the at their fingertips. They may come from an a area um, of poverty, impoverished. If you're in a spot where you just don't see any way out, I am the mm -hmm. mentor for you. Mm -hmm. I want to be that one to help you, give you not a hand out, but a hand up. I want mm -hmm. to be that one to help you see a brighter day when it doesn't look bright when you leave and go back home. That's the kind of mentee I'm looking for, that one that's striving and want and desires more, but their environment is not allowing that for them. And I say all of that because that's where I came from. That's what I had. And there was someone that reached back for me and helped me to raise above, rise above what I was living in. So that's the kind of mentee I look for. And if you are out there and you're looking for someone to help you get out of the situation that you're in and you have the drive and the motivation for it, I'm the one for you. So at the end of the line, mine falls very similar. Um, <laughs> charisma was my word, is somebody with a lot of charisma. Um, those who know me know I run a little bit faster than the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> so um, someone who can keep up with that um, mm -hmm. and wants to keep up with that. Mm -hmm. um, really, I look for people who are looking for something within themselves. 
Um, I was a young mom. I did not get my education until later. That was the path that my life took me. But having that motivation within myself to go figure out what that was and having those people along the way in my career who took a chance on me, who saw something that maybe I didn't see at that time. Mm -hmm. So helping find that person who doesn't necessarily see what they're all made of, but I see that charisma and their desire to really make themselves better. And at Joe Cal, we really keep our doors wide open and we mean that genuinely because anyone who wants to walk in them, any employee, and like you said, somebody who's might be in a bad time, nothing brings me more satisfaction than working with an employee and seeing them overcome whatever that yes. challenge was and come out on a better side. Yes. And that just, that's what I'm always looking for to help mentor. There we go. <laughs> amazing and in each of your answers there was a hint of something that was similar and that's talking about diversity and that's another thing that i see looking in this crowd we all look different we don't all came come from the same backgrounds i mean how does diversity each of you think help with business success and i'm going to start at the end <laughs> to keep right. your there we go <laughs> So for me, diversity finds itself in business, and I say that in a sense of we really hire the best person for the job. We look for the talent, and that brings diversity to us. We have a very diverse executive team in a sense, um, you know, we, whether it be male, female, gender diverse, or racial diverse throughout our organization, and we just really look for the best person, somebody who fits that position and has the skill set and that brings our diversity. And in leadership, I think that's really important, especially with our key executive team, because we take our diverse backgrounds and that's how we answer things. That's how we respond to them. And we respond to them honestly from that and it helps us all work together and just collaborate in such a different way because we all come from different experiences and we bring those experiences to the table and we vet that out and we're able to come walk out of that room with a much better decision than if one of us would have tried or if all of us thought the same way. Mm -hmm. So I think that diversity and leadership is just key and sometimes it naturally finds itself. You don't have to necessarily hire for it. You just hire for the best person. Yes, she said it all actually. <laughs> <laughs> in all honesty, just trying to have a diverse leadership team. Uh, in your workplace so that the different ideas can come together to create synergy and to create a better business work uh, workplace for you and, and it allows you to grow your business when you have a different and, and like she said it's not always a different race a different sex you know you can bring different ideas we have veterans in our place we have we do have different race we have veterans we have a different group of people from the um, from our community so when you make your business look like your community, then you are bringing that diversity into the workplaces that we're living each and every day. And that's usually my, my uh, desire. I don't always hire the best person for the job because then I may have, in my field of cyber, I may have a room full of white men and that wouldn't be good for my business because they are they led the way when it comes to cybersecurity. But I love the fact that they're now where there are women, of uh, Asian women, white women, they are uh, black men, you know, there's just different races of people. So I don't always, I'm not always able to choose the best person that may have the knowledge. Sometimes I may go to the second best person so that I can have that diversity when it, um, in, the, in the business as well. Okay. I think one of the things, um, when we looked at it for employment within the city of Chesapeake, we too want to make sure that we are as diverse as the community or the city in which we're in. And we are a population of 250,000, we're the second largest in the state of Virginia. Um, land mass wise, we're just as diverse as we are anything else as well because we have a suburban, we have an urban, we have a, a rural area. So how do you take all these eclectic types of things and be able to bring them together? And I think it's the collaboration of it all that mm -hmm. makes it diverse. Um, diverse in thought and diverse in what you see because um, whether we want to admit it or not, it is a matter of the first thing you do when you pick something up or you look out into an audience is you seek who the people are that are there and what impact they can have on it. Um, we're looking um, in things a little bit differently too. You know, um, as Chief Equity Officer, I struggle with that title. And I struggle because 
how do you balance um, when it comes to race, when it comes to gender, when it comes to thought, when it comes to people in terms of their internal um, neurodiversity is now a, a big word that you hear about. We're going to have a generation in which we really have to look at how do we adapt to different people when they're coming in in terms of how they work and how they think. So we um, took um, a, a risk in some ways. Um, persons may be familiar with Myers-Briggs and that uh, speaks to the inner person. Mm -hmm. So we have what we call real colors, because Meyer Briggs is like an alphabet suit. By the time you learn what those alphabets are, you've forgotten them. But with real colors, it's four colors. And the idea and the concept behind it is that when you see, um, we're going to put them actually on our name badges, so that when you interact with someone, you will know their temperament. Mm -hmm. It is not about, um, uh, it's, it almost gives you who they are as you begin to work with the person. And it helps you when you begin to interact. So if you look around the room, you're looking at the person's temperament. Guess what I am? I'm what they call a blue, a kind of a feeler kind of person. You know, I want to get to know, but there are persons who are very concrete, who are very strict. They're usually our goals. So they want things to be like this and then green, but they're, even those real colors, there's a little bit of all those colors within us and how do we work so that when I begin to present something to someone who maybe has a certain temperament, I kind of think about it. If I'm going to go take it to my boss, uh, Chris Price, who's the city manager, he is a gold green. So I have to remember that I need to be very structured in terms of what the information is and how I give it. But at the same time, he knows I'm a blue. So he kind of rolls me back and says, OK, quit feeling on it. Let's, let's look at how we, can, <laughs> how we can get the business at hand. But at the same time, though, it's that eclectic approach that really helps with the collaboration to make a success within an organization. And the caboose this time. <laughs> um, when I hear that question, I think about if we sat around a table with our team and everybody looked just like us and brought the same experience and went to discuss a situation or a challenge, how one-dimensional that yeah. solution would be. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I think the diverse team is going to be a successful team when everybody around that table looks a little different, brings a different suitcase of experience with them, and all the members around that table are willing to hear them and listen mm -hmm. um, and think about. I mean, it could be a very foreign idea to you. You just never considered that. Um, but to have some time to process it and come back together. And I think the diversification really um, exhibits itself successfully when all those different personalities and experiences around the table start to complement one another. Mm -hmm. They're not just butting heads and walking the opposite direction, mm -hmm. but they're willing to yes. entertain new ideas. And then I think they start to complement and create a very successful team. Mm -hmm. And all of you are so decorated in your careers and your professional journey. It is really inspiring to hear someone say that. But is there a milestone or achievement that you can think of that really set you on the right track and you thought, I did it, I made it? I'm going to start from the end again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure when we were starting. <laughs> so, um, I start personally with um, my most, um, my largest achievement in life was marrying my husband because then we had our son and I ended up with a wonderful daughter-in-law and a spunky two-year-old granddaughter. Right. So from a personal perspective, that is the greatest achievement I can possibly have in my life. Um, from a professional perspective, four years ago when I got a phone call from Susie Kelly and she asked if I would make a move to Chesapeake, Virginia. Um, I told her yes, then I hung up and called my husband and said, um, <laughs> we're moving we're from doing. Florida to Chesapeake, Virginia. Um, that really was when I got on that plane on a Friday night. I, we told the team that we were making a transition in our leadership team. And on that Wednesday on my lunch hour, I bought a house, called my husband, told him I had bought a house um, to put our house in Florida on the market. And I never looked back. And I 
simply just trusted Joe Kell. I trusted Marty and Susie Kelly. I trusted in having the opportunity to come here and lead our corporate headquarters and know what fabulous things could go from there. So that was, that was definitely the defining moment for me and I regret not a single minute of it. And it just truly is, it gives me total enjoyment every day to pull into that parking lot and what I do and to work with all of our branches. We have five branches across the US, um, two out in California and two in Florida, and then um, the one here. And so it just is fantastic. And that was my moment of this, this is what I've been meant to do. And now it allows me to really have an impact on our employees' lives and to help them grow and be the best that they can be. And that's what I love. All right, all right. Well, you said it, family. I definitely um, am very excited about the fact that my children work in our business. You know, they do different things with us. My husband's always at my side. Mm -hmm. We're at each other's side, always. But I will say that I battled ovarian cancer about 12 years ago. I retired from the military. And about five years after that, I was working civil service, and I always wanted my own business. I always said I was going to have my own business in cyber. I wanted to do something different because I was in an industry where it was Kimberly, black female, and all white men. And they all treated me well. It was not a problem with that, but that's all that it was. And they agreed that we needed some diversity. So when I was working in that role, I um, believed that after getting that ovarian cancer, everyone that may have faced, faced a life challenge, you know that when you go back to work it's like no <laughs> this is not it <laughs> this is not what I'm supposed to be doing I realized that there was a job for me and a mandate on my life to go out and help people so we started our business RFK solutions 12 years ago almost 13 years ago now and that is the deal for us to start that business so that was so that the income that was generated from that business would allow us to do the nonprofit work that we wanted to do. And that was in growing young kids in cybersecurity. We have a cyber academy that we host every year. We've done it around the country. Now we've done it in Florida. We've been asked to come in Houston and down to Atlanta with the cyber academy. And we are going to have one here this summer for the children ages 10 to 17 to teach them cybersecurity, a multi-race of children. As well, I, we've been blessed to not just have the business, not just train the children in cybersecurity, but what's near and dear to my heart is helping marriages excel, bring, helping mm -hmm. people in their marriage. So We Activate Marriages has been birthed out of ovarian cancer, so I don't frown on ovarian cancer, pushing me and Ricardo to start RFK Solutions. RFK Solutions birthed the Cyber Academy for children 10 to 17 years of age. And it also birthed We Activate Marriages, allows us to pour back into marriages and help because that is the foundation of our country. Foundation of our country, marriage. And so we do everything that we can to help in that area when it comes to. So that that's why that's what I'm excited about. I'm excited that I came from Little City on Fire in Titusville, Florida. <laughs> Floridian. Yes. <laughs> and that where we started, I mean I what is, what is I can't remember that rapper, Drake. It started from the bottom now. <laughs> I mean, really, God has really blessed us to be able to do the things that we're doing because of the fact that we gave back um, into the community. So I'm excited about what God has done. I think it's a journey that yes. we all have. Yes. And um, when you ask if there's one moment, I don't think there's one. I think that there are moments that yes. um, change you. I think mm -hmm. that mine started um, when my father passed of a massive coronary mm -hmm. unexpectedly. And that's all I can say. He was 59 and a half. He had just retired. My mother had retired. And they were going to have their life. And things changed. My mom became a single mother of a 14-year-old. Of a and I'm in college. Do I go home? Do I not go home? But my mother says, you're not coming home. You're going to finish that master's. You're going to do what you need to do. And it was hard to leave because you questioned you know, am I doing the right thing? But, you know, those are the things, though. She, had, she saw something, and that's just it. That's the other thing. Sometimes people see something in you that you don't even see in yourself. And she always did that, and so did my father. But there were many other persons that saw things that maybe I didn't see in, in myself. And one, in which was Dr. Cuffey, who hired me mm. so that I could become <coughs> the deputy city manager. And I've been, I go in every day, 18 years later, 
I'm excited to be there. I feel blessed every day that I get to go in and do what I love. It's a, it's a passion and you help people. It was very simple, you know, someone to, you know, that's what I've always wanted to do when I was 16, when I was 10, can I help people? And the opportunity to be able to help multiple people, oh my goodness, mm. what a rush you can that get is, yes. from being able to do that. So I think that there were multiple um, times in my life, but I think that health challenges, that also puts you in a different perspective in terms of what you're going to do yes. and how you're going to do it. And um, I'm, I'm a very low risk person. I've always you know, tried to structure everything, but what you realize though, is that things don't always go as you plan. You know, you plan to have children. At one point I didn't think I have, and I started on my, my baby was gonna be my dissertation, mm -hmm. but there was another plan. Yeah. My, my children, I got pregnant as I was in my middle of my dissertation. So it's wow. like, what are we gonna do? Well, my husband said, we're gonna finish this, this baby, both babies, <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna move on. So it, it is a matter of being able to um, look at what, 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 what's given to you mm -hmm. and how do you go forth in it. But um, probably what I've learned is sometimes we as women struggle to ask for help yes. or struggle to ask different things. But don't, it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of weakness if you don't ask because you don't learn or you aren't able to build. So I think that's probably one of the things I've learned is that you have to be able to ask for that help and that support, whether it's your spouse, whether it's your best friend, whether sometimes it's somebody you don't even know. So I hope that you all take advantage of the mentees, mentees out there and find mentors or maybe your mentor out there that I'll connect with after we get through here. So thank you. I, I agree with Wanda. It's not one particular moment, either personally or professionally, but many thankfully mm -hmm. um, and I think professionally I'm not a fan of change a lot of times <laughs> um, whether it's the fear of the unknown or I just like things nice and static in the way they are but change will come yes, Lord. whether you invite it or I'm not, not. <laughs> um, and professionally that was probably my moment I was in a small law practice comfortable like the folks I worked with knew all the folks I worked with and it was brought to us to merge with a much larger firm. And of the three attorneys that were there at the time, I was the one going, no, <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. I'm, I'm comfortable, I don't know what that would bring. Um, but we came to an understanding and we merged with Kaufman and Knolls. Then, um, I've been there now 21 years. Um, so I think it's going to stick. Um, <laughs> my fear of change was probably not as founded as it, I thought it was and should have been at the time. Um, but I think that was my moment is to accept that change as it comes. Again, God's clock keeps perfect time. That's where I was supposed to go when I was supposed to go um, and accepted that. And of course, it's been just a wonderful experience for me for the last 20 plus years. Um, and then personally, you know, I'm going back to the motherhood thing, but I think it was the birth of my son. Mm -hmm. um, they tell you when you get married, oh, your life is going to change. Ladies on the front row, your life is going to change. Mm -hmm. And it did a little bit. But when that baby comes, oh. yeah. it really changes. <laughs> There's a whole new set of concerns and responsibilities and worries and things like that. But I think it's also an opportunity um, to pour all that has been poured into you into your own little there to to, to raise that person um, the way you were raised I think a lot of times maybe to correct any mistakes that you thought maybe were made mm -hmm. um, but that to me will be my biggest legacy and the biggest moment um, in my life is definitely becoming a mom at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I'm going to say that's amazing again. Um, I'm going to say it as many times as I want to. And I just want us to all take a second, a moment to realize, and even though I was too young to experience this, that there's a time that an event like this with women panelists and a crowd full of women wasn't a, a thing. It wasn't feasible. It wasn't possible. So each of the panelists here, each of these women, what do you feel, how do you feel being on this panel and 
seeing young women and just seeing women and men supporting this event. How do you feel? So for me, um, I mean, obviously very honored to be here. This is not something that I normally put in my wheelhouse and do. Um, I, I spent um, a lot of my younger years looking for the attention and wanting to be the center of attention mm -hmm. and learned somewhere as I matured and um, took space in my life that that wasn't necessarily the best place to be, that I just wanted to be about myself, focus on the people who were important to me and believe in what I could do. And so being here, having the crowd of people we have, having a younger generation who is looking at the four of us and um, listening to what we have to say is just really inspiring for me. Um, it's an honor, mm -hmm. but it's also an inspiration um, that anyone would even want to listen to the answers of my questions, oh, my um, you know, to be here and know that I can maybe offer each of you something, a little nugget that you can take away today, something that you can bring forward with you and help make you better. Um, for me, if building my career was about believing in myself and having that self-assurance and knowing that when people told me I couldn't do it, that I knew I could. And so uh, it's just an honor to be up here. Yeah, for me, I feel accomplished. I truly believe that with the young ladies we see in the room, husbands and men in the room as well, we have the ladies right here on this panel have, we blazed a trail for moments just like this. We have gone through things that you guys probably have, will never have to see. We've taken those hits for you to be able to sit here on this front row today and enjoy a moment like this. And, and um, I'm excited about that. I'm happy to see the change that's taking place in the culture that we live in. Mm -hmm. To see that women, young women, older women, can older women can change careers and be okay with that. You know, those are the things that are exciting me. Just sitting in this room and seeing this, um, it's a nice change. A multi-race of women in the room is amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I Sometimes I have to catch myself because I'm, a, I'm really pro-woman. <laughs> 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 I really try to fight for us hard. But uh, that, that accomplished, accomplished is really what I feel today, that we have done a, a great job, I think, of helping to uh, blaze the trail for each and every one of you. For those who know me well, this has been a um, struggle for me. I am, I'd much rather be in the background and working with things and making things happen rather than to be in the front. I'm not um, one who um, really likes attention. So um, for, but it is, um, it, it does speak to though how you need to take that risk mm -hmm. and to be able to say that you're there. Because sometimes you have to sit back I don't think about where I am. Other people have told me, do you realize that you're the, an African-American woman who is the uh, highest level in an organization? Mm -hmm. And when they tell me that, there is a level of fear that comes into my heart that is incredible. Mm -hmm. Because I do see it as people are looking at you. When I put the DR in front of my name, it was not because I wanted the recognition of it, because there's an expectation that people, oh, she's a, one who can articulate, she's perfect in this, she's a researcher, and it's the expectation that comes with it. Can you handle the expectation that comes with being it? But remember, you have number one, God on your side, yeah, and number two, you have people that believe in you, and that's what's most important. But as women, if I had to give a nugget, we have to realize we have to help each other. Sometimes we are indeed our worst enemy. enemy. That we don't speak out, that we kind of suffer in what we believe and we'll go and we'll talk to others. I am one who, who was fortunate enough to find the love of my life and be able to get married. There are other women that may indeed choose not, not to. to. And that's good, that's okay. Because you will find self-assurance in other things, whether it's internally in yourself or with working with others. So we have a panel of, here of women who were fortunate enough to find that male who saw us as equals, because if not, I don't think we would have remained in that relationship. Yeah. <laughs> but you also have to look at those that maybe choose not, not to. to. Mm -hmm. And again, that's okay. Yes. So um, I, I don't know if that answered the question or not, but I too feel very honored to be here. 
And I thank you all for giving me the opportunity to share just a little bit of what it is. And I see uh, the youngest of the young over there who is clinging to daddy, but I know that she's thinking about mommy along the way and how proud she is. And one day you'll look back on this and you'll say, I'm mom doing this because you'll be one of those persons sitting That's in right. this chair doing just the same thing. And I don't know about you ladies, but it seems like we were just in those chairs over there, <laughs> and suddenly we're up here. I don't know quite how that happened yeah. so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to thank the Economic Development Authority, one, for the opportunity and for hosting this. I just think it's a wonderful opportunity for everybody in the community, young ladies especially, um, to be exposed. And I would encourage you, when you see an opportunity um, for a similar event, and I know your schedules are busy and it's difficult to get there, but certainly try to carve out that time. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing I would encourage you to, I feel very inadequate next to these ladies. They're no, no. very accomplished mm -hmm. and I, I appreciate the opportunity to join them. Um, but look around your community as well. Um, you're going to find mentors some places you don't expect to find them. Mm -hmm. um, and while great panels and presentations are nice, I think you're also going to stumble upon some relationships that you didn't yeah. expect. Mm -hmm. um, and they may be the most rewarding of those relationships to you. So try to keep your eyes and your ears open um, at, as you go on your journey. Um, and look for those opportunities, not only in formal settings like this, but to build those relationships that, that you just stumble upon sometimes. Yeah. I'm gonna start at this time. Ah, oh, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> and we've been talking about, you know, work, careers, businesses a lot, but I think as important as it is to be on when you're in the office, I think it's also important to know when and how to turn it off. Have that separation once you go home. But as I know, it's hard to do. You wanna always be on, you wanna be advancing to the next day, you wanna think about what am I gonna do the next day, but how do you turn it off? And do you think it's that important in your life? Let's start, I'll start from you. We're back here. <laughs> That's a quick turnaround. Keep you on your toes. Um, you know, it's difficult to turn it off. And I think especially with our cell phones, with our emails popping through, ringing, um, every chance you turn around, it's difficult. Um, I try to make a concerted effort because you do finally get to that point that you feel like I've got to step back or I'm just going to burn myself completely out. Um, and I think um, family and friends are mm -hmm. the ones that help you do that the most. Um, you know, when we go out to dinner, put the phone up. If my, you know, my son and daughter-in-law are there, leave it alone for a little. It's going to wait. Sometimes there are things that are more important than others, and I understand you have to check on those. Mm -hmm. um, but I think my biggest means of stepping back and turning it off is to just get away from that technology, even if it's for an hour at a time, mm -hmm. and, and give your family and your friends your full attention instead of one eye on the cell phone and you know trying to, to divide. I think it's important to really be present um, and mm. make sure that you recognize what a priority that downtime is to your physical and your mental health. I think um, through maturing through your work, I think that you learn how to consider and what is downtime. Um, and people look at it very differently. Some people incorporate their downtime with their, with their life and the impact that it has on you physically, mentally, and how do you, um, how do you move forward on it. Um, I have to go completely away, um, and my husband um, is very good about letting me know um, that um, you can't have this, which I'm <laughs> my cell phone, and you have to go completely away. But I think at the same time, though, when you, when you do that, be prepared because when you come back, there's a tsunami that hits you. So how do you, how do you spread out that tsunami from, from coming back and um, getting you along the way? But at the same time, I think if, you're, if you can integrate some of those times together, 
and if you enjoy what you do, and I enjoy what I do, so, um, and your family gets it, it really helps to have that, again, my word, balance, in terms of being able to do things. I, I'm a big believer that it is all about the balance. Mm -hmm. Awesome stuff. So uh, on Saturday, my husband and I celebrated 23 years of marriage together. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> very difficult for us to turn it off, for me to turn it off for him, because of the fact that we work together. We were in the military mm -hmm. together, we, <laughs> we served together, we have the business together, we're in ministry, we preach to you all. We do all of these things together all the time. So no matter where we are, we always seem to be on. But this last weekend, for our anniversary, we chose to ensure that we turned ourselves off. So we literally did just what she said. We turned these phones over. Uh, we created a little game, a date night game, and we took our own game that we have for other marriages, and we took the time out to go through and answer questions together. And it really felt good. We both said, um, this really felt good to take these three days and turn off the world mm -hmm. because we're both engaged in everything together and just really focus on one another. And that made such a difference for the both of us. Now, what happened was on Monday, the tsunami hit. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a great time together. Um, and we learned that because we work together, we really have to make an effort, a conscious effort, because we believe in work hard, play hard but we have to make a conscious effort to turn it off at least monthly, uh, even if it's just one full day, so that we can um, really pour into each other and grow our marriage so we can have another 23 years of success. So I'm not very good at the day-to-day -day turning it off. Um, as you all said, it's, you know, it's difficult to come home and just turn it off. Um, it really has to be those, that time that you just shut it down. Um, I fortunately am headed to Quebec City next weekend um, with my husband and meeting my son and daughter-in-law and granddaughter there. And it's times like that that I can turn it off. Mm -hmm. um, I often say holidays and trips like that, I'm going to regret that we have no pictures, but it's because I don't pick my phone up. Um, for my 50th birthday, my husband rented a mansion in Ohio and brought all of my friends and family and awesome. I lost my phone day one in that mansion and everybody kept saying, where's your phone? I'm like, I don't know, it's somewhere. <laughs> um, but it didn't matter because the people that were important to me were with me. And being able to set that phone down and focus on those people at that time and just not worry about the pictures that came out of it because you know what? No one else cares what they are on social media, only you do. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, letting that stuff go and just being present in the moment um, and having my granddaughter has really changed that for me. Just, I don't want her to know that Kiki's got her phone or isn't gonna see when she tumbles in you know, her gymnastics class or whatever it is she's doing. I want her to know that my focus is on her and that is way more important than any text message or any email that's gonna come in in the time when I'm with my family. Absolutely. I'm gonna clap. <laughs> <laughs> now, is it time to take some possible questions from the audience? If not, I can ramble forever. <laughs> I have a mic and I can talk forever. Okay. One or two questions from the audience? Okay. Um, so, if anyone from the audience has a question for one of our. Oh, your hand shot up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think um, when I was in high school and you start looking at college and then you've got to start thinking about a major and, and it's a lot to, mm. to do at that stage of your life. Um, and I was fortunate in high school, I took a business law class in my junior year that I really enjoyed more so than most classes in high school. Um, and I started to focus on that. And in my English class, we had an opportunity that year to pick a career and write a paper on it. So I, building on the business law experience, I picked a paralegal. And I, so I did my paper on that. And shortly after that, um, I was with my parents at a couple's house that they were friends with. He is now a retired Chesapeake judge. Um, and my mom started telling him about this paper I had written and that maybe she might be interested in going in the legal field. 
And I was so proud of my paralegal paper. I was like, I got, this is wonderful. I think I might know what I want to do. And I remember this judge, he put his glasses down here and looked <laughs> over him at me and I got really nervous. Um, and he called me by my first and middle name, which they did either if you were in trouble or they've known you for a really long time. And he said, you know, if you're going to do this, if you really think this is something you're interested in doing, you need to go to law school. Mm -hmm. And that scared me to death. I was thinking, that's a lot of school. I don't know if I'm <laughs> up for all of that. Um, but it stuck with me. And I will tell you that I have since given that advice to other people. Um, but I think that really set my bar where it needed to be. I had identified the field, but I really wasn't sure where in the field. And just that encouragement and that advice set me to that course. I think it, um, for me, it was very different. I knew that I wanted to help. And so I ruled out the, my mother was a teacher and no disrespect, if there are any teachers in the house, I ruled that one out. <laughs> it takes so much, you know, I saw her, you know, do the lesson plans and think about when I saw her do all the hard work. Not that I don't like mind doing hard work, but it was the late nights. What people don't know is, it's, it, is, it makes my job that I do now look so easy because hers was, you know, you get the summers off. No, she did not get the summers off. She was still working. But um, I think that um, for me, I just knew I wanted to help people. I wanted to make sure that people had what they needed in order to be successful in some way. So how I went about it was, again, I guess it was the process of elimination. Um, I, I went in to become a physical therapist. I am the furthest from a physical therapist than you'll ever see. Um, you know, because think about it. You know, they want to declare major when you first walk in and you're 18, and you all, at, you all have these. It's a whole world of yeah. jobs, of different things that I've never heard of. My, you can become a professional gamer. Who knew you could <laughs> do games and make big yes. money on it? I would have never. In a, yes, <laughs> yeah. So, but get your passion. This is what I tell my, my boys who are uh, 23 and 26. Find your passion and you'll do well at it. So, um, you know, is there a direction? You know, now you all are so eclectic in terms of your knowledge and your skill base. Um, it's predicted that, you know, you're not gonna stay in this particular job for five years. I mean, I had, um, I changed jobs. My uncle, rest his soul, he stroked out when I told him I was leaving a federal job, which oh, was yes. a wonderful job that I enjoyed, and I was going into leave to go to a local government. He was like, what are you doing? I mean, he really panicked for my future because he didn't realize he was used to that 30 yes. years, stay in it and do it. But um, for me, I'm always an advocate for social work because those are communication skills, they're interaction, and you can use that in any capacity. Who thought that a little social worker from Moyock, North Carolina, I'll disclose from where I'm from, <laughs> anyone who knows Moyock is about this big, it's grown, but it's about this big, could become the deputy city manager for the second largest city in Chesapeake. So set, set what your passion is and you'll do fine in whatever it is that you want to do. Awesome stuff. We're gonna go all the way down. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Well, I, wanted, I wanted to be a radio DJ. That's what I thought. I really did. I love music. I love all types of music. So I thought I was gonna be a DJ when I was getting ready to graduate high school until I went to the Navy recruiter's office and they chose for me. You wanna be a radio DJ? I got something for you. So they made me a radio man. But <laughs> and to be a radio man is not what it appears. It's exactly. <laughs> I was in this cold room that had to be 55 to 60 degrees, and I was working on computers. So life chose my career path for me. The, the military for 20 years, that's what I did. You know, afterwards, I'm still from computers in the military. I started a cyber company. But I'm believing at the ripe old age of 55 that I just see on the horizon that I'm gonna have me a little talk show where I can play some music on the radio. I'm putting that out there, 88.1. <laughs> that it's gonna come full circle for me. You know, what I believed that I wanted to do did not happen, life made choices for me, but I truly enjoyed everything that I've done along the way. So don't pin yourself, you know, that's one thing I will say. Don't think so hard about do I have to know what I want to do at 18, 19, and 20 years of age? Because life is going to change all of that. 
I promise you that. It, it just doesn't happen that way. Don't let people make you think that the little roses that are blooming, that's the way life is going to happen. It does not. Situations change. Thanks. Situations do change, and when I was going to head off to college, um, I ended up married and had a brand new baby. So life does change. So as a young mom, I was 18 when my son was born, and never did I think I'd be sitting in this seat at 18 years old with a newborn baby. My husband was an airman basing in the Air Force at the time. So um, life didn't start the way we quite thought it would, but um, it's ended up in a nice path with a lot of hard work so mm -hmm. i also went into hr and i was an executive assistant and i thought this is this is where i'm going to be and someone did a personality profile on me and they said you are on the wrong side of the house you are an operations girl through and through and when they i moved over to operations i am a get stuff done girl and i it, it's my niche it's my passion it's mm -hmm. where i belong and that was 10 years into my career to figure out that i was successful at what I was doing and I could do what I was doing and I could help run an office, I could do the HR, I could help with accounting, but I really didn't have a passion for it. And once I got into business, um, I too was going to be a physical therapist. Um, so uh, that's, that is what I thought I was going to be when I, before I got married and had my son. So, um, you know, after 30 years of marriage and raising a child and watching him take, um, his career, and my son was the opposite. He said, probably at 12 years old, that he was gonna be a veterinarian. And, you know, okay, he's 12. My son is a veterinarian. <laughs> um, he never, that was his passion. But wow. that was the, you, you, plenty of people have used that word, passion. It's, you will find your passion. And you're not, you may not know that at 18, you're probably yeah. not, and your world is going to change. But um, pick a path, and you'll know when to diverge. And those lessons will come to you as you work through your career. Great answers, and thank you for that great question. Have great you ever question. thought of a career in journalism? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we're going to wrap it up, but I just want to give another round of applause to these great women for being here. Amazing. And thank you, audience, for being here. Yes. Yes, thank okay. you. Um, okay, that was wonderful. Again, give, give these panelists some wonderful round of applause. I had two takeaways from that. Number one, God's clock keeps perfect time. Absolutely. And the other one was, started from the bottom, now we're here. <laughs> right. but, but seriously though, um, you know, I learned a very, very le valuable lesson from my father many, many years ago. Before he passed away, he said, he said, Stephen, nothing will change your life like a good woman. And I was very fortunate enough to meet my wife a long, long time ago. I've been married for 33 years now. But also I've learned over my time, particularly here in Chesapeake, that nothing will enrich your business, your organization, like having strong, good women uh, work in it. If you have good women within your organization, within your business, they will support you, they will lead you, and they will inspire you. And I think our panel today is a prime example of that. So let's give them another round of applause. Thank you. I, I do want to take a, a, a personal point of privilege to recognize some women that inspire us in the Economic Development Office every day. Um, you already heard from Kistine Plar. Where's Kistine? Over there. <laughs> also want to recognize Constantia Cobert. <laughs> Ms. Sherry Barnett. And one of our newest staff members, Ms. Palmer Lugo. These women do an awesome job of making sure that the economic development uh, department runs smoothly. I uh, also want to recognize uh, another one of our deputy uh, city managers, uh, Loris Fitzpatrick. <laughs> and another one of our EDA members, Economic Development Authority members, Ms. Julie Anderson, our vice chair. Well, this has been a wonderful, wonderful event. We are so pleased uh, that so many of you came out 
Uh, we appreciate you being so generous with your time uh, on a Friday morning. Uh, to all the young people here, I want to say, please take advantage of opportunities like this. Get to know these women. Get to know other women uh, in, your, in your schools, in your homes, in your uh, churches, whatever. Uh, women provide an awesome uh, array of inspiration, uh, resources. Um, it's just always good to have women in an organization because they really provide balance because sometimes us guys don't always get it right. Right, Justin? Right. Uh, <laughs> at least that's what my wife tells me. So um, with that, uh, we want to close you out. Um, we want to say, again, thank you for being here. Uh, this is a first for us. Uh, something that we we've okay. said we want to do this for the first time. Um, do you think we should do it again? Yeah. All right. Well, you come back March of 2025, and we will do that. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one more thing. There's one other very important woman that I want to recognize, and that is Miss Elizabeth Goodwin. She's the caretaker of this wonderful facility. Let's give her a round of applause and have her come up. Well, thank you so much for being here today and thank you to the team at Chesapeake Economic Development for uh, hosting and thinking of the museum for the location of this wonderful, wonderful event. Um, the Great Bridge Battlefield and Waterways History Foundation is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to protect, promote, and preserve the history of the Battle of Great Bridge and our waterways. And when the opportunity presented itself to preserve a portion of the battlefield, our foundation went to work to raise funds and awareness to work with the city of Chesapeake, the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and preserve the battlefield uh, um, to develop the historic park and build this museum. And today, our nonprofit operates the museum, and we host hundreds of school children. We host events and programs throughout the year. So if you have not had an opportunity to visit the museum, please do so today and pick up information about our upcoming events. We would love to see you back at the museum. And thank you, Chesapeake Economic Development. All right. Thank you. Um, again, we want to recognize our speaker and our wonderful hostess, and I think we have some flowers for, for them, so please. All right. Well, again, thank you all for being with us today. Uh, I'm going to encourage all of you when you exit, do not exit out the side door. Exit out the back door, uh, and as you go out the door, you'll see a little glass box. If you want to make a donation, that's okay too. All right? So again, thank you for being with us. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you next year.